Michael Bonifer, thank you so much for coming to the show. To be in these places at, at, at the time that. So yeah, I'm in the right place at the right time. Because, you know what's happening now? I told you the Jamaican accent was going to come right. out. I'd love to be able to name all the bands, and I can't. We but, can't but, but I know I'm going to miss You've been called selfless, you've been called kind, loving, all kinds of stuff. We know you're passionate about Talk about your little 10 month old son. Yeah. Talk about that, your pride and joy. I love, I love my son. His name is Jawari, and he was born on Christmas Day. He's what? Welcome to Pep Talk. We have a very interesting segment this week. We're talking to women who are walking tall, and these are powerful women who reside in the Washington DC area and they're doing tremendous work in the community as well in, as in their personal lives. Our first person that we're gonna interview this week is none other than Lloyde George. She's a lawyer and a jazz vocalist. Miss George, welcome to Pep Talk. Welcome, thank you, thank you. Okay, so you have one of those names that's a tongue twister. It's actually spelled funny and it's pronounced even funnier. What are you talking so, about? So um, tell me about the origin of your name. Where are you from and where did you get that name from? Actually, my name is a Portuguese name, mm -hmm. but my parents are African. Um, they're from countries that were colonized by Portugal. Mm -hmm. So my mother's from Mozambique and my father's from Guinea-Bissau. Mm. And um, both, both countries, as I said, were colonized by Portugal. So we all have Portuguese names. Right. And where did you grow up? Um, I was actually born in France, but I grew up in California. Parlez-vous français? Un peu. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't speak a lot of French. She <laughs> obviously does, because she grew up in France. And when did you come to the United States to live? When I was five. So I've been here quite a long time. Okay. We're not yeah. getting into that part, yeah, how long yeah. that was. Yeah, no, And a little no. bit about your education, because I know you moved around a lot. Was that on purpose, or...? Um, actually, my parents, okay. um, for school and work for them. So I was pretty much a part of the family package, so I traveled with them. But we lived in France, Michigan, California. And um, I've since moved from there, but that's where my family has had their journey. Okay, and how long have you been in the D.C. area? Ten years. Okay, and what did you major in school? What was your major? Um, undergrad was clinical laboratory sciences. Wow. <laughs> Nothing to do with what I do now. Okay. Yeah. And what is it that you do now? I'm an immigration attorney. Wow. Okay. So um, how long have you been practicing? Four years. And how has it been so far, business-wise, setting up your own practice, that sort of stuff? Actually, I didn't start on my own. I started in a small firm. Um, and then I branched out about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love it. Um, it started out as a risk, I guess you could say that, because anytime you start out as a single person running a business mm -hmm. plus practicing law, you're, you're juggling several hats. You're juggling the business, you're juggling actually being a practitioner. It was a risk, but I absolutely love what I do, so it, so far it's worked. And how do you go about getting your clients? Actually, to date, it's been word of mouth. Mm. I've only in the last couple of months started using social media to, you know, propel what I've already got going. But to date, it's actually been word of mouth. So how many clients would you say you've had within the time that you branched out on your own? Oh, my. That many? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I, I think every month I'll get... I don't know, between five and ten new clients. And okay, new up. clients. So you think that you've been doing pretty well for the word of mouth to have spread, so you keep getting new clients. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm no Johnny Cochran. I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I don't have a huge firm. I'm still, you know, working it solo. However, I'm, I'm busy. Okay. And I make it a point to take cases that I actually can do something with. And that means taking your time. Mm -hmm. So it's not really about volume at this point. It's about getting quality cases that actually I can do something for them. So, why why did you decide to go into immigration law? You know, when we were f when we first came to the U.S. in the '80s, um, the, it was a time when immigration law was going through a transition, and under Reagan's um, under Reagan's administration, he had an amnesty policy, mm -hmm. and it was, my parents went to Catholic legal charities, and Catholic legal charities made all the difference in getting my parents through and getting mm -hmm. us all legalized, and I remember the relief, you know, I was, I was really young then, but mm -hmm. I remember the relief that quality attorneys actually cared about what was going on, what, 
how that made a difference for my parents. And I've never forgot that. I've never forgot that. And actually, actually right now I do pro bono for a Catholic charity. So, wow. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about one of your more challenging cases. If you, I mean, immigration is a tough, tough all around, but tell me, is there one that you can remember that was particularly challenging for you as a lawyer? Because it's always challenging for the person who, who is dealing with that particular case. I think actually my first case when I was in law school, and um, uh, it was an asylum case for a young lady from Uganda, and uh, her story was hard. She had a child, and it was the, the product of a gang rape from the soldiers who had abducted her in the forests of Uganda. And um, it, technically, that case wasn't hard, but emotionally, it was, uh -huh. it was tough. But the back end of it, it was so rewarding to, at the end of the interview, usually you'll get a letter saying yes or no for whether or not you have Appro you know, an approval for an asylum. At the end of the actual interview, the officer was like, you got asylum. And just the joy, I mean, that, you can't, you can't replace that. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at your website and you have a lot of testimonials from clients who you've worked with and one in particular says, Miss George is the type of attorney that takes her job seriously. She's very patient and you can reach her anytime you need her. She is also very humble and on top of that, she is very friendly. Now, tell me how you separate being friendly versus professional with your clients. I, I found, and I, this is something I learned at home, I found that to be effective and thorough, you don't have to be a jerk. And I think a lot of times the whole idea with an attorney to actually act like you know what you're doing, mm -hmm. the persona is that you have to be a jerk and be that person out there that's out there crushing people's ego. And especially with immigration law, I mean, you're dealing with people, and these are people's livelihoods on the line here, you know, whether or not they can fulfill the American dream here mm -hmm. or have to go home, and it, there's no room for ego in that. And plus, I mean, I love people, so it just, it, it, it goes with my personality, so. And, I mean, you love people, so I know it's kind of difficult to practice law and not form friendships from your practice. Most of us who are business professionals, even though we try to be professional, sometimes friendships are inevitable. So are there any people who you've worked with who you have a steady friendship with? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll get invited to baby christenings, I'll <laughs> go to people's homes, and the beauty of it is my clients are from all over the world, so I'll get introduced to cultures and um, customs that I would not have had any exposure to except for like the National Geographic Channel. So it's, it's very rewarding on so many different fronts. Wow. So Lloyde, and I'm calling you Lloyde because it's just easier than saying George. <laughs> I think we're friends so I can call you that, right? You can call me that. Okay, so from your testimonials, a lot of people or the majority of the people, in addition to all the kudos that they've given you, they keep going back to the fact that you're very smart and you know the law and you're on top of things. I mean, they're always emerging immigration laws and they change stuff and they do this, this reform here, that reform there. How do you stay current with what's going on so you can really inform your clients about the best course of action to take? I think, well, I mean, with any craft, you have to be well versed in what you're doing. So, and, and it's interesting to me. So I'm always reading on what's the latest. And then I'm part of organizations that routinely update everybody that's uh, a member mm -hmm. on all the latest information. So I, and you don't do your job well if you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the laws are constantly changing and or they are applied differently depending on the facts. So, I mean, I would, my reputation would go down the tubes if I actually didn't keep up with, with the law. So it's to my benefit. Plus, I like it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're constantly learning about yeah. new stuff. That's every hard. day is every every new every case that walks in. I mean, maybe the general details you you know how the law mm -hmm. works, but you're always figuring out nuances because the idea is you're trying to find a way within the law to help somebody. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you have to get creative. You have to dig. You have to read. So that that comes with the territory. Okay. Yeah. And I know also that what you started doing recently since you started your own company and you're reaching out through social media is sending out tips of the week. Um, what, what are some of the things that you would say to people who have tough immigration cases and they're trying to figure out how they go about getting to know 
what they should do, what's their responsibility versus what their lawyer should do for them. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I think one of the biggest pitfalls that I see when clients come to me is either listening to their friends who had cases that they think are similar mm -hmm. to them. So they're getting basically street corner advice. I mean, that's not to say you can't speak to people that you know and say, hey, what do you think? But at the same time, I mean, th we're dealing with the law. And if it's, if it's any other area of the law, you more than likely would go and get a lawyer. And immigration is no different, especially when one wrong turn could mean the difference between staying here or paying lots of money to be able to stay here to an attorney. And then the other thing is people not vetting the attorneys that they're going to. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one of the areas of law that is ripe with bad attorneys is immigration law. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes people, you know, don't take the time to figure out, is this person good? Do they know what they're doing? And so a lot of my cases are cases that have been messed up, and they didn't have to be. So I, it, two things, one, well, one thing, vet who you're going to and don't try to solve your problem yourself. Um, some things are basic, but if you are scratching your head wondering what to do, that probably means mm -hmm. you need to find someone, pay a consultation fee, and right. actually figure out what your options are. And I know that some of the big things that people have, even if it's an easy enough case, is the whole tedious task of filling out those immigration forms and keeping records of those. Is that a service that you also help people with? Sure. I mean, that's part of what I do. If your case is straightforward and you're savvy enough, there's a lot that you can do on your own. Mm -hmm. But if you've got layers, and sometimes you don't know if you have layers, and that's why at the least pay a reputable attorney and sit down for a consultation. A reputable attorney won't take your money if you don't need them. Right. However, they can at least tell you what your options are. And you probably won't even know what issues are lying in the, in the closets unless mm -hmm. you actually go for a consultation. And what about affordability? Because many of these immigrants, um, I know some of the issues that they have is that they probably are in the country illegally. And so <laughs> their documents are not together. And so their papers might not be together. And I mean, do you do pro bono cases? Are you flexible enough to understand the conditions that they're going through? And so you'll customize their price based on their situation? <laughs> I do. Um, well, there's two things. Um, I do customize prices. I also do payment plans. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're coming to me and giving me your firstborn child. I mean, I, I work with you. But that being said, sometimes you have cases where the people just don't have the money. And there are actually wonderful pro bono programs within the city, like I said, mm -hmm. uh, Catholic Legal Charities. And I do pro bono work for them. Right. So I, if, if I can't help you for the price that you can afford, mm -hmm. then I will refer you to somebody who can. But it, you know, there's always options, but you have to know, you have to actually be proactive and seek those options. There's always somebody out there to help. Okay. And where do you see yourself as far as being an immigration attorney in the next, say, five years? Huh. Huh. You know, I never thought about it five years from now. <laughs> Two. <laughs> <laughs> I still want to be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea how big or small I'm trying to... For me, right now, it's been a process because I'm also balancing the ba the business end as well as actual practice. I just want to be at a place where I'm not thinking about the business end. Right. I'm just practicing. So if I could think about what I want to do in five years, dedicate myself to the law, and maybe you know by then I could afford somebody to handle the business. Okay, and I know yeah. I asked you this off camera before, but you also have another side of you that you're also very maybe equally passionate about. That's the jazz vocalist side. Yeah. How hard it is for you to balance your day job versus your night job? And I know the jazz vocalist thing is not just a night job because it's something that you eat, sleep, and breathe. I mean, how do you go about balancing that? Well, actually, I've had to accept the fact that I cannot have both tracks full speed ahead at the mm -hmm. same time. There's no way. I mean, anytime you do something or anytime you want to do something well, you're going to have to give 100%. Or let me say that a different way. Anytime you want to see something project really fast, you probably will have to give 100% immediately. I, there's not enough hours in the day. So I've accepted that the music is going to be a slow burn, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a quality slow burn, and I'm okay with that. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, 
we'll talk about what happens to Miss George in the evening when the real Lloyda comes alive. That sounds so scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for staying with us. If you missed it, we're interviewing Lloyd, who is a jazz vocalist. And in the first segment, we spoke about Lloyd's work as a lawyer. That's her day job. And for this segment, we're going to talk about the beautiful music that she makes. <laughs> First question. Yes, Rosie. When did you know you were going to be a professional singer? I always, in kindergarten, I think it was like the year after we moved to the U.S., we had a little stage play, and um, I was one of George Washington's friends. <laughs> and I was singing about how he sewed, uh, how Betsy Ross sewed the American flag. I mean, that has nothing to do with anything except I knew at that point I wanted to sing. So. And you, did you tell your parents that you want to be a singer? Oh, they always knew. Okay. They always knew. So were, were they a stickler for, no, you have to do something more professional like practice law? Or were, were they like, okay. You know, it's interesting. They always fostered that passion, but they never had any type of encouragement for me to actually make it into a profession. Mm -hmm. But as, for as long as I can remember, I was in choirs, chorales, little singing groups, um, little uh, shows like uh, talent shows and they were always right there rooting for me but I don't know that they ever really thought hmm maybe you should become a professional singer no okay and no. does any of your family members also sing or they're in the my mom sings oh really yeah she's in corrals and she sings all the time at home <laughs> <laughs> okay so tell me a little bit have you had any formal voice training I have where I have. I'm in high school and in undergrad and a little bit after undergrad and actually my focus in high school is classical vocal music so actually ch church music and classical music is the roots of how i was trained mm -hmm. but that's not where the music is right now okay and yeah. then when did you decide that you wanted to do jazz because i mean you're a jazz vocalist that's 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 who you are you're just a singer i mean what genre do you... Do I you have coined my own term. Okay. An Afro-Lucifone jazz vocalist. Wow. Explain what that is. Yeah, you know, people are always trying to call yeah. themselves whatever they want to call themselves. <laughs> no, um, Afro as in African, Luso as in Portuguese speaking, mm -hmm. and jazz as in that's the, the Western influence. Mm -hmm. So it's a thorough combination of all three. I'm African, I speak Portuguese, I grew up in the U.S., so all those three come out in my music. Okay, and when exactly did you decide I'm going professional? Now is the time that I'm going to take this talent that I have and I, I should be taken seriously as a vocalist. Do you remember when that was? Yeah, actually after my parents had no say-so anymore. <laughs> <laughs> How many years ago was that? After I finished undergrad, I decided to cultivate it on the side as I was pursuing my graduate studies. And, you know, at that time, I come from a very strict, structured family, and, you know, a lot of those extracurricular activities were mandated that they take a back seat. Mm -hmm. So when I had the, the flexibility to do what I want, I did what I wanted. And so that, that happened after I graduated from college. 
Okay, let's talk about some of your influences. Sure. Who are they? Uh huh. Um, Cesare Vora from Cape Verde. Um, Rita Marley from the yeah. I3s. Um, Mahalia Jackson. Um, Sade. Uh huh. Uh, Lena Horne. I could go on and on and on. There, I mean, those are the classic, classic voices that I hear. Uh, Leontine Price, she's an African-American um, classical vocalist. Um, current singers. <laughs> I mean, you can't beat Beyonce. Her, her voice is awesome. Um, Erica Badu. I could go on. I love music. Okay. I love music. So... so um Let's talk about writing your songs. Do you write your own songs? I do. I do. And you, you actually, some of the songs that you've recorded, they're done in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Do you worry about um, English speaking people not understanding what you're saying? No, I mean, for one thing, I listen to music from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of times I don't know what people are saying, but the music talks to you. Right. And even if they're speaking English, let's say, for instance, if they're from the islands, and they're speaking a patois, and if you don't have any exposure to that, I don't know what, when I first started listening to reggae, I did not know what was being <laughs> said. But I felt it, you feel it, right. you feel it. So, I mean, no, for the most part, and actually, at my performances, nine out of 10 times people will tell me they enjoyed the music mm -hmm. that I sung in Portuguese the most because they could tell that I felt it the most. Right. And when you feel it, they feel it, so it, it works out. Tell me about some of the cover songs that you've done, because I know you're all over in terms of the music that you like. I think I heard you do Bob Marley a couple times. When you're thinking about doing a cover song, mm -hmm. what is the deciding factor? Is it the message in the music? Is it the melody? How do you go about selecting songs to do a cover for? Two things. One, if I actually felt it. Okay. And the second is if I can sing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some music you love, but you have no business singing. <laughs> So, I mean, it, it's twofold, but the primary thing is that I'm, I'm feeling it as an artist. And then I don't just sing it the way that, you know, I think the idea with a cover song, well, there's two ways people do it. They take it and mimic the an original artist. Mm -hmm. I tend to not do that. I tend to take my own interpretation and bring my own musicianship into the music. Can you just give me a sample uh, right now? You better put push play on the CD. No, I'm serious. <laughs> That's the no. other thing, Rosie. I'm extremely shy unless I'm on the stage. Are you shy, really? Mm -hmm. Are you shy right now? Mm -hmm. so I feel like another person. You know how Beyonce says she has like Sasha or Sasha Fierce? Mm -hmm. Carmelita. Really? Yeah. Like you're not really Lloyda, you're like somebody else? I'm somebody else. That's why I don't want to sing for you right here. I'm so not Carmelita right now. When you're performing and you have your friends like Joanne and you know, Penny Section, I'm not looking screaming. at them. I never Because I remember look at them. the last performance, they were doing that. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, does Lloyda not see me cheering for her? Why is she not connecting with me? That's why. <laughs> live at Bohemian Caverns. Let's talk about the making of the CD. When did this happen? Last year. Last year? Yeah, last year, last, last June, June 2009. And how long did it take you to do this whole CD project in terms of the cover shots, the songs, putting them together, you know, finding a venue to do it, and why did you decide to do it live? Well, there's two things. I knew that I did not want to be in a studio with tracks. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted musicians, quality musicians that I've worked with and that I know. And I knew that studio time plus play, paying all the musicians was going to cost money. Mm -hmm. So actually this was a CD on a budget. <laughs> That's what it boiled down to. It's the 
it's the best way to, um, and, and then also you get to capture your essence live mm -hmm. too, because mm -hmm. you know there's the banter in between CDs, uh, excuse me, in between tracks that the listener is able to catch, so that they get the personality of the artist that they're listening to. And then on top of that, um, there's no magic, there's no smoke and mirrors with my music. Mm -hmm. So what you hear is what you get, and this is the best way to get it. And actually some of the CDs that I love the best were live, live recordings, CDs, yeah. yeah. So tell me about some of the people who you worked with on the CD. I see Cuckoo's name on it, a bunch of other names, lots of musicians yeah. in the DC area who are doing things worldwide. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, one of the main creative contributors to this was uh, Mongezi Ntaka, mm -hmm. and he was actually Lucky Dubé's original guitarist, and um, he has since been in the D.C. area for a while, and he has his own projects, but he and I have collaborated artistically because he plays reggae, he plays jazz, and he plays township jazz, which is an African, Southern, South African version of jazz, mm -hmm. and so it was... It was a great combination of our cultures and our loves, and um, he's also been in the industry for quite a while, so he was able to add a professional layer to the compilation of the CD. And then the others are local artists. Mm -hmm. Janelle Gill is on the piano. She's the other woman in the, in the, on the CD. And then there is um, Taurus Mateen. He's on the Spanish bass. And then there's Mark Prince. He's on drums and percussions. Okay, and I see you have a couple covers on this. You have Love is Stronger Than Pride mm -hmm. from Shade, mm -hmm. And you have, um, what's the other one that you have? Something by Hugh Mas Masakela. Yeah, Soweto Blues. Soweto Blues. Yeah. And you do have Concrete Jungle as a I've bonus got, track by yeah, Bob Marley. I do. And you're still not going to give us something live. You better push play <laughs> on the CD. <laughs> okay, so um, this was done in 2009. Are you working on another album? What's what's going on for Lloyd Dett, the vocalist? Um, right now, I'm, I've actually been quiet on local performances this mm -hmm. year. I've done some live tapings for television shows and um, private gigs. But as far as live gigs, because of the law, the music has taken a back seat this year. However, um, actually, after I leave here, I'm going to rehearsal, so the music is not completely dead. <laughs> okay. Now, I've got a show coming up in a couple of weeks, so um, the idea right now is to cultivate more original tunes. Okay. And in 2010, if the budget affords, maybe we don't have to do a CD on a budget. Maybe we can actually go into the studio. Who knows? 2011. Oh, time, yeah, we're, time. We're in 2010 right now. Time, yeah, 2011. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Um, one last question. <laughs> if you had to choose between practicing law, doing immigration law, and being a jazz vocalist, what would win? I'd be a singing attorney. <laughs> A singing attorney, okay. I don't believe I have to choose. Okay. Yeah. And that's that's important that you don't yeah. have to choose. You can actually fulfill both of your passions yeah. at the same Why time. Why not? Why okay. not? There you have it. So it was great talking to you. And I look forward to coming to one of your performances to hear you live since you're not singing live for me today. Please do. And for those of you who are out there, look for Lloyd's CD online. She's all over. It.